thanks everyone for joining um, uh, this um, seminar event by um, Geographies of Optimism uh, research project, I suppose. Uh, and thanks to Dave Featherstone for agreeing to give the talk today. Dave is a reader in human geography at the University of uh, Glasgow, the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences, uh, and a very good colleague and friend. Uh, he's written extensively on uh, space and politics, broadly understood, I suppose, uh, focusing on questions around uh, solidarity, uh, left-wing politics, identity formation, and so on and so forth. Over the past few years, or perhaps it's a kind of a older interest that kind of resurfaced, uh, Dave has been also working on populism and kind of what we might broadly understood as the geographies of populism uh, and um, has written uh, about this in, in, in various uh, forms. I suppose um, I should say that I tend to agree with what Dave writes on populism because we tend to write together about <laughs> <Get> populism. <together. laughs> so um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, have Dave here uh, to talk. Uh, I need to find the title of the talk. Sorry, I'm a bit all over the place. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. I, I, I can introduce the talk, it's fine. No, no, yeah. don't worry. It's yeah. struggle that they would be talking to is between the culture wars and leveling up, reflections on the space and politics of authoritarian and populism. Dave will talk for 40, 45 minutes, I suppose, and then we'll have some time for questions from you. Um, yeah, thanks again for joining. Floor is yours, Dave. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. So thanks, thanks so much for kind of inviting me to be part of this conversation. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really, um, and as Lazar says, this is something that the set of issues that I've been engaging with, partly kind of with Lazarus and, and partly, I guess, in terms of kind of impetus, a lot of the kind of impetus for kind of um, engaging with these sort of questions is because of their, I think their kind of political kind of importance and kind of urgency really. And I think, and in that sense, I guess one thing just to note in terms of this, this paper is it's very much trying to kind of engage with a set of kind of questions of um, around populism in relationship to quite a specific set of debates around how the, the kind of right in, the, in, in Britain is kind of reshaping kind of aspects of the kind of political terrain, political landscape. So I do, in terms of the kind of talk, what I'm going to do is kind of like I've got a bit of an intro, then I'm going to situate it within some of Stuart Hall's writings around authoritarian populism, and then I'm going to look at three interrelated aspects of the kind of Tory Conservative Party's right-wing kind of agendas around their notions of levelling up, their kind of engagements and kind of investments in kind of various forms of racialized politics in terms of the culture, uh, notions of the culture wars, and some notions kind of, particularly in terms of kind of um, aspects of kind of politics in, in relationship to the north of Ireland in terms of kind of cultures of impunity for kind of um, uh, former military personnel. Um, and then I'm going to end with some kind of brief reflections on, on the kind of left and, and how the left kind of is or isn't responding to some of these questions. So I think, and I'm actually going to start in that sense with, with a kind of Guardian comment piece by the mayor of Manchester, Randy Burnham, that I found really, really startling. Um, and it's in, um, it was written at the time of the Conservative Party conference in I think late, late September, early October. And it was kind of interesting because at one level, it kind of struck quite a different tone from kind of the dominant kind of rhetoric of people like Keir Starmer. At this, at this point, Keir Starmer's kind of major investment in this period was just attacking the left of the Labour Party. He didn't really have very much to say about um, about, about the Tories and what the, uh, I'm going to, and probably just out of habit, I'm going to, uh, going to use Conservative and Tories as interchangeable. Just, um, um, just, I, I, um, I'll try not to because I know not everybody knows what the Tories are, but to, just to kind of, um, if I refer to the Tories, that's who I'm referring to. It's a kind of matter of habit to kind of refer to them as that. So, um, and but, but in some ways, so you have this big attack from the Labour Party going on in, in terms of figures like Keir Starmer, the leader in terms of the left, which I think is going to be very troubling and very kind of problematic in all sorts of ways. But in some ways, what I'm going to argue in this talk is that actually the kind of ideological positioning of Burnham in, in this um, 
article I find actually kind of more troubling and more worrying for, for kind of reasons I'll kind of hint at at the start and perhaps return to in the final section of the paper. So in the, the talk, in that comment piece, Burnham was very explicitly engaging with this term that the Conservative Party is using as one of their central kind of terms, kind of levelling up. And he argues in this kind of this kind of passage or kind of central passage in the piece that was a kind of short comment piece in The Guardian, but it was published on the day of Boris Johnson's um, kind of speech to the conference. So there's kind of particular timing. He argues, if the prime minister were to commit today to London level bus fares for Greater Manchester and elsewhere in England, it would certainly be noticed by voters. Finally, leveling up would mean something. That's the prime minister's task today, to take a free phrase that is at risk of signifying everything and nothing, and bring clarity back to the core mission of this government. And then he kind of goes on to kind of talk about tensions with his, part, uh, with his chancellor, but then talks about how this detention is resolved will determine the fate of the Conservatives at the next election in the Red Wall seats. So in some ways, this is a kind of anodyne comment piece talking about what, the, what Boris Johnson should have in his um, conference speech. But another level, what I find really alarming and startling about this piece is the extent to which um, Andy Burnham, who actually in, in some ways through the pandemic has been a kind of mildly centre-left populist figure, probably one of the kind of key figures in British politics who has taken on the Tory government and kind of articulate a, di a different kind of um, northern kind of position in terms of debates in, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the UK as well, kind of. And, um, but what I find startling and alarming about this piece is the extent to which he is arguing within the terms that the Tories have kind of defined in terms of what levelling up is. So there's no kind of uh, critical unpacking or, or attempt to kind of challenge the broader terms of debate around levelling up that the Tories have, have, um, have, have made central to kind of political debates, particularly in the wake of the 2019 election, um, which I'll kind of refer to perhaps in the, in the middle of the talk. And I think this is kind of problematic for two, two key kind of reasons. So I would argue here that Burnham's account accepts the political narrative established by the Conservatives around levelling up. And he's also done that um, if you follow um, the link here, um, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, which he leads, has kind of developed a kind of levelling up GM. Um, that's not GM refers to Greater Manchester, not gen genetically modified. But um, but it kind of again speaks to the ways in which the um, Burnham as a kind of mayor is kind of really shaping a political narrative within the kind of broader confines of the political terms of political debate set by the Conservatives. He also uses quite uncritically the term Northern powerhouse that has been a kind of key element of kind of um, UK kind of conservative regional policy over the last few, um, few years. So Burnham's account, why does it matter that Burnham's account accepts the political narrative established by the Conservatives around levelling up? For me, it matters in two key ways. Firstly, as a geographer, I'm appalled by the way in which um, kind of levelling up has been accepted uncritically as a kind of intervention in terms of the spatial politics of Britain, which ignores why there are broader uneven relations of power which result in spatial inequalities in the first place. So there's no sense, so there's a kind of liberal framing of spatial inequality which just accepts it as a pattern that is, is problematic, but just needs to be addressed, rather than thinking about um, spatial inequality as something that is shaped by a whole set of kind of uneven relations and kind of thinking with Oscar and Martin going back, we kind of think of, of, of kind of a long tradition of kind of writing that kind of looks at um, uneven geographies of power, inequalities as something that is actively produced, going back to kind of classic texts like um, Antonio Gramsci's aspects of the Southern question. That, so one, one reason I, I, I think that's important, it, uh, one, one reason I think this is so alarming is because of that, but the second is the way, and I think this is a kind of broader kind of tendency, perhaps on the left, is to abstract levelling up from the kind of broader authoritarian populist project 
which the Tories or the Conservatives are kind of are kind of entrenching in various different ways. And actually, the kind of in some ways the kind of inspiration for kind of thinking leveling up and kind of questions around the culture wars and authoritarian populism together came from a really interesting talk. We had a, a, a seminar a few weeks ago that we had in um, uh, um, Glasgow by a geographer from Andy, called Andy Williams from Cardiff. And he was arguing um, in similar terms of the need to think about the, in, in quite a different paper, but he was thinking about the need to kind of think about how um, these kind of regional policy discourses were linked to kind of broader kind of racialized constructions of, of, of the kind of white working class. And that's what I'm going to kind of turn to later in the paper. But what I'm going to think about now is thinking about the importance of seeing kind of questions of kind of leveling up as part of a kind of broader authoritarian populist project and thinking about how that means that we might approach questions of kind of populism from a kind of spatial perspective. And one of the things I think me and Lazarus have tried to do, and Lazarus has kind of worked in, in various ways around it as well um, in his own work, is to try and think about populism spatially and to kind of think about that, um, the, the insights um, doing that um, kind of can, can bring to kind of debates on populism. And to, to think about that, I'm going to have a brief detour through some of Stuart Hall's writings. Um, and um, I'm going to start by drawing on a kind of definition of populism that, um, uh, because I guess that's kind of, uh, I think it's kind of useful to kind of think about different ways in which we define populism. I don't really want to get bogged down in that because I know there's a huge set of kind of debates there. But I think I think what what is interesting here is kind of is the way that Paul's um, engagement perhaps offers something at a kind of broad level that kind of he then works out in in a more kind of detailed way in terms of some of his writings on authoritarian populism. So writing an essay on on in the wake of in relationship to the Falklands or Malvinas war in the um in in the early 1980s called the kind of Empire Strikes Strikes Back a, a great really pithy um a, a kind of analysis of the kind of emergence of kind of Thatcher's populist discourses. He argues that by, by popul he applies notions of populism to kind of understanding Thatcher. And he argues, he makes quite a specific claim about how he's thinking of populism in this regard. So he argues by populism, he means something differently from being able to secure electoral support for a political program, which he argues is a qual clearly a quality of all politics politicians in formal democracy must, must possess. But he argues rather the project central to the policy, politics of Thatcherism to ground neoliberal politics directly in an appeal to the people, to root them in what he terms the essentialist categories of common sense, experience, and practical moralism. And in that essay, I'm not going to talk about that essay in any depth. I'm going to move on to kind of discuss a kind of different, a whole essay um, where he really outlines ideas of authoritarian populism in a set. I think one of the really important aspects of, of the essay that this is taken from is he kind of gives a sense of how deeply notions of the people in relationship to the, the Thatcher project were kind of constructed through and in relationship to ideas of kind of race and imperialism. And, um, and I think that's really important in terms of Hall's work is that Hall's very attentive to the particular kind of uh, he's not I think a particularly kind of refined spatial thinker but he's a kind of he's a, a, a thinker who kind of is directly insistent on the importance of kind of thinking about what he termed the kind of conjunct locating populist politics in a kind of broader conjuncture and I think in this sense I would I don't want to kind of I've probably kind of presented this slightly starkly for for the kind of one of this for the purposes of the, this discussion but in some ways I want to kind of just um, argue that kind of Paul's conjunctural approach to populism offers different kind of resources than what I would, I, I would term the kind of perhaps more formalist approach to populism associated with Ernesto Leclerc and I don't want to kind of draw too stark a line between Paul and, and Leclerc not least because actually I'm not going to talk about it but the 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 depth, but the whole, whole essay that I'm going to talk about in a bit of depth 
um, next um, kind of draws on Leclerc's actually earlier writings, um, politics, some of the essays in politics and ideology and Marxist theory, which I think are interesting to kind of read against some of his later, perhaps more kind of kind of quite doctrinaire notions of populism in, in on, on populist reason. So um, in this sense, I, I want to suggest um, that conjunctural approaches are kind of an approach to populism that kind of really kind of locates populism in relationship to particular spatial and temporal dynamics, offers an alternative to the formalist theorization of populism developed by Laclau in, in some in kind of later writings, particularly in on populist reason. And in that sense, I'm gonna, I don't want to say Leclerc's account doesn't have really significant insights, but I, I think it tends to lack an attentiveness to kind of questions of specificity in problematic ways. And I want to argue that the kind of mode of engagement of Paul offers a kind of way of engaging spatial and temporal dynamics, which offer a different lens, can offer different, and I think potentially slightly more productive lenses to kind of engage with populism. And further, I think one of the kind of concerns I have in terms of Leclerc's account is, is how, how much he kind of flattens populism and, and, the, and the relationship between populism and the political. So, so it becomes unclear at times um, in terms of when he's thinking about how antagonisms are constructed. He obviously gives a sense of antagonism being constructed on the left and the right, but there's a kind of failure, I think, to be attentive to the ways in which thinking about the spatial politics of populism can help us engage with what Anna Santamarina describes in a kind of forthcoming essay in Soundings, about kind of hybrid political formations, which shape very different articulations of populist politics. And I think that's a really important set of kind of interventions is thinking about the different terms on which kind of populist politics might be envisioned and how they are rooted and grounded in particular kind of contexts and conjunctures. And, and to think about this, I want to kind of look at um, Paul's essay, which is reprinted in Hard Road to Renewal, which is, I think, called sort of popular, popular democratic versus authoritarian popul populism, two ways of taking um, democracy seriously. And I think from the outset, I think it's interesting that he compares popular democratic versus um, authoritarian populism, because it, I think it kind of gives a sense of a kind of broader, more kind of generative sense of kind of popular democratic politics, rather than perhaps some of the kind of more tightly defined notions of, of left populism that Leclerc and, and, and that Mouf particularly develops with, with a kind of very strong kind of elision between popular democratic politics and a, um, and a strong sort of charismatic leader in the kind of, in her, her left populist book, which I think is a pretty problematic text in lots of ways. But going back to the whole essay, what's interesting in terms of, I guess, an intellectual genealogy of that piece is, is, is it's very much, and, and this is something kind of coming back to it, is it's very much a modification of, of Nicholas Balancis, the Greek uh, Marxist ideas of authoritarian statism. But I think it's interesting the kind of spin or kind of inflection that Hall gives on, um, on kind of in, in changing the terms of debate from authoritarian statism to authoritarian populism. So he argues what Publis Palantis's account of authoritarian statism admits is the steady and unremitting set of operations designed to bind or construct a popular consent to what um, Palantis argued were new forms of statist authoritarianism. In, and here he's referencing um, Palantis's last book, State Power and kind of Socialism. It is this element, Paul argues, which introduces into the equation the pivotal issue of popular consent to these new forms of statist authoritarianism. And it is this present process, he argues, as a movement towards what Hall defines as authoritarian populism. And I think one, one kind of perhaps kind of problematic, uh, one perhaps commonality of the kind of problematic here is that they both kind of see populism at this kind of juncture in the kind of as being very much around a kind of crisis of the state, which I think is important, but also kind of perhaps shapes a kind of engagement with populism through quite nationed kind of geographies. Um, and that's something that we can perhaps kind of also discuss of the kind of how, 
what kind of ge ge geographical kind of framings do we think are, are necessary to think about populism? But what I'm, I kind of think is interesting in as that essay progresses is the ways in which he traces um, some of the days, the different strategies through which Thatcherism constructed itself as with as being with the people. So he argues in, in a whole set of ways that kind of Thatcher, despite all the um, kind of horrific aspects of her kind of policies, obviously one of the kind of key problematics that Hall was grappling with is that despite everything, Hall was, um, that Thatcher was able to kind of mold forms of consent among certain parts of the population in, certainly not all, and Hull, Hull would never have kind of suggested it was all for her kind of neoliberal kind of politics, what he would refer to as a kind of neoliberal common sense in, in, in ways. But what I'm interested in here is some of the, the strategies he's, he's kind of unpacking. So he argues against the representation of the power block, are counterposed various condensations of possessive indi individualism, personal initiative, Thatcherism and freedom as the positive pole, it is possible then to represent labor as part of the big battalions ranged against the little man and his family, oppressed by an inefficient state bureaucracy. And I think this is kind of perhaps a key term, key sentence that I'm going to kind of pick up on in terms of thinking about how we might think this spatially. The social democracy is aligned with the power block and Mrs. Thatcher is out there with the people. So there's this kind of paradoxical construction that actually a very statist politician in the terms of kind of, of, of Thatcher, was able to kind of present herself as kind of being aligned with the people against certain aspects of the state. And what I want to kind of do in, in some ways in the rest of this talk is think a little bit about some of the ways in which certain kind of rhetorics around kind of spatial inequality and kind of and spatial imaginaries are being used by the kind of current kind of um, kind of uh, government, a, a current conservative government to present themselves as with the people. And, and I want to kind of suggest that thinking through some of these spatial imaginaries and how they're being mobilized can help us kind of to kind of unpack what's what's going on, but also hopefully to kind of come uh, to a more kind of fierce kind of opposition to some of some of these terms than is kind of represented by by the kind of acquiescence of, of figures like Burnham and Starmer to the kind of terms of debate being shaped by the Conservatives. So as a starting point, I guess I want to argue that levelling up needs to be read as a populist spatial kind of narrative. So levelling up has, has, has emerged, I think, particularly in the wake of the 2019 election, when um, the Conservatives won, unfortunately, a kind of huge pretty significant landslide by winning a whole set of seats in the north of England, Midlands and north of England that, uh, that had been Labour kind of seats for, in, in many cases, a kind of decades. So it was a kind of very significant political shift in terms of where Tories were getting, getting kind of seats. So, um, so why do we need to think of kind of levelling up as a kind of in, a, in populist terms in that sense? So I would argue that it's, it's kind of a, a, a populist narrative around regional inequalities because it shapes a, it shapes the kind of cross, it's a, attempting to kind of shape a cross-class electoral block, what John Clark refers to in a really insightful essay in, in Soundings as, as the Boris block. And it is designed to entrench the particular constructions of, of, um, of white working class voters associated with um, the so-called Red Wall. So these, these kind of seats that were lost by Labour to, uh, to the Tories have become known as this um, kind of Red Wall, which I think is a kind of, um, which has been mobilised in, in all sorts of very problematic ways, both by commentators and politically in the wake of the 2019 election. There's been a kind of it's kind of fed into a kind of long-standing tradition to kind of homogenize the north, to whiten the north, to kind of present um, and and pivoting back to, to Burnham also to kind of not really analyze the kind of long-standing unequal processes that have shaped um, it um, the kind of um, kind of 
entrenched regional inequalities between different parts of England and more generally in terms of the UK. Subsequently, I think it's also important to kind of see how levelling up has been articulated with the kind of pretty kind of um, entrenched and um, brazen forms of corruption that are beginning to um, become increasingly prominent in, in um, the UK under, under kind of Johnson's kind of regime, obviously um, uh, kind of symbolised by his own corruption, but I think it's becoming a perhaps, um, I suspect it's kind of issues that have always been there, but have become more kind of to the fore. But I think in terms of the, um, one of the kind of ways this is kind of shaping some of the debates around the kind of Red Wall is that resources have been funneled very kind of brazenly into constituencies won by in the North by the Conservatives in the 2019 election. So, and I think that's kind of a really important kind of thing. So there's a kind of clear sense that if you voted Tory in the North, you are kind of much more likely to get a kind of better, better kind of investment and stuff like that, I think. But also, I think it's important to note how that these strategies also align awkwardly with other government strategies. So at the same time as you've got this kind of broad homogenous leveling up narrative, the, the government is also rolling out um, regional policies that are kind of by their very nature um, intensifying kind of um, regional kind of inequalities themselves. So the government's recently announced the uh, formation of eight new free, free ports, which will be special economic zones Actually, most of these um, aren't concentrated in, in, in the north. There's, I think, one, one in Teesside, Liverpool as well. But these, these are basically classic special economic zones where labour rights, tax, right, t um, tax levels will be kind of be reduced, but which will also clearly have a kind of impact on how regional development plays out across Britain. It's, they, these aren't kind of, um, th these are kind of deeply, um, embedded in a kind of neoliberal logic of competition. So I think that's that's kind of important. Um, and I think in this sense, while I think um, Johnson has been very astute and effective at, at shaping himself as a kind of insurgent within the Conservative Party, and at, particularly in the 2019 election, winning, kind of creating this kind of Boris bloc of disaffected Labour voters um, with um, kind of long-standing conservative ones. These kind of forms of kind of more populist ways of intervening in um, kind of regional kind of policy or kind of local policies have, have a kind of a recent history in the conservatives. So we can see some of the kind of populist tropes going back to some of the debates around localism um, associated with David Cameron. Um, and, and, the, uh, and I think that's important to kind of trace these connections rather than to think of, uh, and, and I think that some of those kind of ideas around what we might think of as local populism were important in, in winning consent for forms of, um, of kind of austerity that they were, and, and kind of um, gain and, and entrenching the, the kind of need for kind of um, or the so-called need for ideas of austerity in, in the kind of period after the kind of uh, 2008 crisis. But what one of the things that I kind of think is really important to engage with in the um, in terms of the kind of some of the ways in which leveling up is being imagined is in relationship to the way some of these debates are kind of racialized, and that gets back. Uh, and I think that links back to some of the arguments that Andrew, Andrew Williams was making when he was in Glasgow. But we can see this in kind of recent reports. So this is a, a quote from the, a, a report by the kind of Education Committee, which is kind of um, uh, a, a, a conservative dominant, dominant um, committee. And, and we can see the kind of direct forms of kind of racialization in the, in the, in the very title of the, um, of the report. It's, report uh, it's called The Forgotten, How White Working Class Peoples Have Been Let Down and How to Change It. And, and what I think is really pernicious about this kind of, um, uh, the, this, with this report and some of the broader discourses of, about it is the way it kind of directly kind of racializes ideas of level, leveling up uh, and in ways which kind of also fit 
different kind of working class constituencies against each other. Um, and I think in that sense, I think one of the kind of key, key kind of um, affinities between ideas around leveling up and ideas of the culture wars that I'll kind of turn to in a sec is this kind of way in which um, these kind of strategies are part of a kind of broader attempt to create kind of racialized divisions, um, which kind of entrench this idea of the kind of Boris block. And it's, I think the kind of idea of a kind of Boris block is kind of something that, which is kind of very much constitutively a kind of racialized political kind of project. And we can see this in, in terms of the kind of language used here and, and the ways in which geography is invoked. So we've got, um, we got a sense that, um, and in, uh, another kind of key term that's been used, which is referenced here in relationship to the kind of so-called red, red wall seats is this idea of kind of left behind areas. And again, that speaks to a kind of, a kind of liberal or conservative framing of regional equality. This idea that places have just spoke, um, become kind of left behind somehow, rather than these kind of regional equalities being actively produced. So this kind of passage talks about geographic dis disparities also affect children from ethnic minorities who live in left behind areas. So, so there's some recognition that kind of um, inequalities are not just um, um, experienced by white people. But then the next, the next chapter, the next chapter, the next sentence kind of kind of gives a very different gloss on that. That said, the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities found that geographical inequality is in simple new simple numerical terms an overwhelmingly white British problem. So here there is a kind of sense to kind of really deny aspects of the kind of interrelation of geographical inequality and kind of and racialized inequality, but to kind of also pit white working class British people or kind of working class whites against um, people from racialized minorities, which I think unfortunately is something that is shaping both aspects of the set of, of the right in Britain, but also for, for a long time, I think it's also shaped the kind of center left narratives. So this moves me on to kind of thinking about how we make sense of this kind of, these kind of very racialized articulations of leveling up. So I would argue that to kind of understand these kind of forms of, of leveling up, we need to kind of position them and the way they're being racialized, but also some of the consent that is being shaped through them. Though I think the realities of kind of what Johnson's doing is also undermining some of that, um, but I'll, we can perhaps chat about that later. And I think Daniel Trilling in The Guardian gives quite a useful sense of how the kind of culture wars are being kind of mobilized in this sense. So he argues that the exact meaning of culture war is often disputed, but it's, and I, I think it's a kind of really problematic term. So I'm, I'm using, I'm engaging with this term because of the kind of traction it has in political debate, not because I think it's a useful term by the way, but it's best thought of as a political technique for gathering a disparate group of people with conflicting, even contradictory interests into your camp. So the, the kind of, Res there's a kind of obvious resonance here with, I think, Leclerc's notion of populist logic. So I think we need to kind of read culture wars as a particular kind of populist framing of kind of politics. And um, I, think, um, I think in terms of the way this is playing out in British politics in the moment, it's kind of very much strongly shaped by the kinds of populist logics that emerged on in, in relationship to kind of break Brexit and the articulations of what um, Bernie and McGeever have described as kind of articulations of kind of racism crisis and Brexit. Uh, that I'm, I, I cite this paper in the kind of uh, the, um, the PowerPoint. I'm not going to, I don't have time to kind of go into it in depth, but I think the, I think it's really important to kind of see these um, debates around Brexit as having um, really shaped the kind of and the, the and the way that was kind of racialized the kind of anti-migrant politics that were absolutely central to 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 that political moment uh, that um, to kind of see how that kind of constitutes constitutes the kind of present conjuncture in in, in that sense. Um, and and in this sense, the kind of Tories have kind of in terms of their kind of culture war politics have talked about a kind of war on woke. Um, 
and, and there are different ele elements of this. Uh, there's the Sewell report, for example, that was referred to in the um, and the kind of longer the education committee report I mentioned made a concerted attack on the ideas of institutional or, or structural racism. Basically, trolled the idea that there was any kind of um, kind of concerted structural kind of racism in, in Britain, which is clearly an extremely kind of problematic position. Conservative MPs have kind of talked um, have um, argued that kind of white privilege is a term that should that. Um, uh, that, that people using the term white, white privilege should be um, dealt with in the same same way as uh, those who support support terrorism um, and and be referred to the Prevent Program. Now the Prevent Program has its own issues, but uh, but that just gives a sense of the the kind of authoritarian edge to some of these debates. And I think that's why we need to kind of be thinking seriously about engaging with them. These there's a kind of strong kind of authoritarian edge to kind of these these kind of political um, um, articulations of populism. And, and as I've demonstrated, it's also been shaped through divisive geographical imaginings. And I think one aspect that um, I really want, I, I'll kind of close in terms of uh, the kind of element of authoritarian populism, which I think in terms of the kind of, is thinking about the kind of, how this relates to the kind of fractured geographies of the UK itself, or kind of fracturing, I think, as a kind of ongoing kind of process of, um, and one of the things I want to contest here is um, what I would perhaps refer to as some of the kind of methodological Britishness that has um, structured some of the ways in which kind of debates around Brexit have been thought, both actually in, in terms of um, kind of broader kind of political debate, but also unfortunately, I think in terms of some of the geographical debate, there's just a sense that kind of Brexit was something that was happening basically in a similar way across Britain, which is clearly a very problematic way of thinking about these processes. But also, I think a, a related consequence is that things like the um, debates around um, the, the kind of situation in the, the north of Ireland are often seen as, and, and the whole kind of situation with the kind of northern Irish, the Irish border, has often just been seen as a kind of unfortunate byproduct of Brexit. It's just happening because, well, people voted for Brexit and therefore there was this kind of slight problem, problematic issue with, with the border. But, and, and I think it's certainly easy to kind of just dismiss this as kind of the current Conservative government displaying a kind of cavalier attitude to the peace process, the kind of Good Friday Agreement which um, was central to the kind of peace process. But what I wanna argue here is that it's absolutely necessary to see the mobilizing of antagonisms in relationship to the border as by the conservatives, as much more actively constitutive of the current UK government's forms of authoritarian populism. And I think one of the ways in which, so it's not that we can read the kind of discussions of the border as just a kind of, by, uh, uh, as a kind of, byproduct or issue, but I think there's much more kind of central kind of elements to the kind of um, muscular kind of assertive and aggressive forms of, of kind of political unionism that they're kind of espousing. But I think in this sense, I think it's a particular significance in terms of thinking about the UK governments and kind of prominent conservative politicians in terms of shaping a culture of impunity for military personnel involved in human rights abuses in Northern Ireland and beyond. And as Adam Elliott Cooper in his book on uh, uh, Black resistance to British policing notes, there are strong kind of trajectories and relationships between colonial trajectories, kind of military impunity in places like Northern Ireland and police racism. And, and he argues we cannot, uh, and he traces some of the kind of links, for example, um, in terms of kind of racist policing in Britain, but with kind of techniques in, in both border colonial context, but also in Northern Ireland. He argues we cannot understate here the importance of colonial policing to the development of police power and racism on the British mainland. These strategies and techniques have colonial roots and should be central to the story of police racism. And I think, I think that links these kind of questions raised in relationship to kind of places like Soldier F to a kind of broader set of colonial kind of discourses that are, uh, uh, that are kind of, I think, are central to any kind of proper reckoning with the kind of 
um, with what a kind of post-colonial, a properly post-colonial Britain might look like, but which are kind of, are being kind of pushed back against both by um, the Conservatives, but I think perhaps more problematically by kind of Labour politicians like like Keir Starmer. And actually, the um, um, Adam Elliott Cooper has been a key kind of activist in Black Lives Matter, and he wrote a kind of really strong um, um, comment piece in The Guardian when um, uh, Starmer, who had initially taken the knee, um, went on to really kind of trash the kind of demands of kind of Black Lives Matter to kind of, re he referred to Black Lives Matter as a kind of moment in very dismissive ways, but also talked about def the idea of defunding the police as nonsense, kind of, uh, and this is kind of part of a kind of broader um, shift towards a kind of patriotic kind of rearticulation of kind of Labour politics uh, kind of in the kind of post Jeremy Corbyn era. So what I want to kind of close with, if um, do I have still a bit of time, Lazarus? Well, I'm a bit more perhaps. Right. Yeah, yeah, five, yeah, so uh, that, that should work. So Nazrin Malik in, in The Guardian, who I think has been one of the kind of more kind of interesting commentators on the culture wars, um, argues that um, the kind of engagements of the kind of from the left in terms of these kind of questions or certainly from the center left have often prevented us from understanding the potency of the culture war by optimist. Uh, so she kind of talks about optimistic progressives, so we're keen to explain that it's all a big misunderstanding. These polite incrementalists believe that even if progressive patriot patriotism once again fails, she's talking about some of the kind of debates around the um, the kind of racism towards black players in terms of um, black English players in, in terms of the World Cup, um, particularly, though more broadly. Um, these polite incrementalists believe that even if progressive patriotism once again fails to fully materialize, the groundwork is none, nonetheless being laid, but the right is creating its own new stories, because the culture war is not about winning a debate about what constitutes England through factual disputes about its character, its statues, its football team, or its history of empire. It is not a peripheral indulgence or a mere confection. Culture war is an aggressive political act with the purpose of creating new dividing lines and therefore new and bigger electoral majorities. Yes, can think of that in terms of this kind of Boris block that Clark refers to. So in the sense, I kind of want to kind of finish by thinking about what this means for engaging with the kind of left, engaging with these questions from the left. How do we kind of push back against, uh, against and recognize this idea that these, these, these kind of, uh, these kind of right-wing strategies around the cultural war are an aggressive political act which is creating new dividing lines, shaping perhaps new uh, articulations of kind of authoritarian populism. So firstly, one of the things that I want to kind of argue, and again, kind of going back to my critique of Andy Burnham at the start of the paper is, it's necessary to contest some of the discourses that are central to this kind of authoritarian populist project. So it's necessarily to kind of contest the discourse of, of levelling up. It's also, I think, really important to challenge the work the term white working class does and, and to kind of really ch to challenge the sort of divisive political logics that are, are central to some of the kind of racialized debates around class in, in Britain at the moment, and to kind of think foreground histories and geographies of ordinary working class multiculture to kind of challenge these kind of very divisive kind of logics which are central to the culture wars, central to some of these debates around regional inequality, but which kind of really kind of um, intensify kind of forms of antagonist, uh, of kind of racialized antagonism and actually kind of, and, and they intensify forms of racialized antagonism in ways which are absolutely constitutive of conservative policy. So it's not, again, a kind of byproduct where this is happening. This is something that's being kind of really entrenched and for, for direct kind of ways of creating particular forms of authoritarian populist politics. It's also important, I think, to articulate alternatives within, within the currents of transnational so solidarity shaped by movements like Black Lives Matter to kind of recognize that to kind of en engage effectively and to challenge authoritarian populist politics, which I haven't had the space to talk about how 
Bernie Johnson relates to kind of broader transnational currents of right wing politics, but I think it's kind of really important that it's recognized that, that that's part of this sort of story. And I think in that sense, one of the kind of key issues with the kind of current UK Labour Party um, kind of set of narratives or, or kind of response to losing the 2019 election so badly has been to kind of have a kind of, um, um, as well as just a kind of broad attack on the left all the time, is to kind of in, um, to kind of refocus on an idea of kind of patriotism. And Danny McKinnon, in, in a kind of paper in uh, the Soundings, really kind of, I think, signals some of, some of the kind of issues here. So he argues that rather than, he contests this, so he says, rather than seeking to echo the conservatives' rhetoric of patriotism and identity, to compete for the same cohort of older, more affluent voters that have dom dominated discussions of Red Wall seats. He argues that a more viable approach may be to target younger, insecure workers in post-industrial areas to try and kind of think differently about what's going on in these places. And he argues that this would involve younger, insecure workers in post-industrial, um, this would involve labor building an agenda around things like employment rights, job creation, public housing, and transport that appeals to voters' common interests, but also uh, kind of can has the potential to create a blocks across different geographical divisions within kind of different parts of, of the UK between kind of things that are kind of perhaps being kind of falsely counterposed at the moment. And, and I think in that sense, just in terms of kind of patriotism, I think this week with the kind of awful events of, of, in, in the channel have also kind of uh, emphasized some of the kind of problems with kind of Labour's investment in patriotism. So rather than um, challenging Priti Patel's authoritarian kind of racist populist politics for the kind of racism and kind of brutality of her politics, Labour have just gone after her for being kind of incompetent, which is just missing, completely missing the kind of broader kind of dynamics of what's, what's happening, but I think is kind of based on political calculations of, of not to kind of upsetting so-called kind of imaginary constituencies of white working class kind of voters. So finally, um, and this is maybe more for kind of points for discussion, Marina Francila sends her, her kind of recent book uh, on left populism by arguing that a transnational left populist project might be the way to bring about change, equality and solidarity, even at the 11th hour. I think there were kind of a set of questions around kind of perhaps certainly kind of what I think to call it a, a, a failure in, in kind of is, is perhaps too, too general but I think certainly the kind of real problems kind of the, and, and kind of fail, failures of, of kind of left populist book, um, governments and projects in terms of Syriza in terms of Demos I think that kind of raises a set of questions about how, whether it's worth kind of revitalizing left populism, but it's kind of perhaps I think something it would be useful. It'd be, I'd certainly be interested in chatting about. But I think there's a question about how might the left intervene productively in a political terrain marked by culture wars. I don't think it's an easy terrain for the left to engage with, but I think I'll just end with three points. Firstly, I think it's important to engage, important just to engage with that terrain, to, to kind of not think that these are issues that, that will go away, but to kind of recognize that they're kind of really reshaping politics in terms of, and, and reshaping things in ways that kind of are kind of having lasting kind of political consequences. It's necessary to challenge the reworking of the political landscape this is shaping. And it's important to find, I think, political narratives that engage with the forms of transnational solidarities invoked by Frantula. So uh, I'll end there, but uh, um, yeah. Hopefully we can have some good discussion and thoughts around these 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 themes.